All right, well, good morning. Just a couple announcements before the kids are dismissed down to Team Kid. For anybody that's planning to go to Village Baptist Church tonight in Mount Morris, we're going to plan to leave here tonight at 5 o'clock. And so if you're saying, well, I, I want to go, but I've got room to ride, can I just ride with somebody? I know Sam's driving. There's a few other people that are going. So if you come here at 5 o'clock and you want a carpool, we can kind of get that figured out. But if you, if you can't make it tonight, please do be in prayer. Uh, Brother Alan Bradley, actually, that we know very well, he's preaching this morning during the morning service. So keep Brother Alan in prayer, if you would, this morning. And Brother um, Matt Meyer from, uh, from out in Horseheads, he'll be speaking during the evening service, and Brother Allen will be bringing a message for the, the youth and the teens tonight. So uh, please be in prayer. If you're able to come out, come out and support um, that, that service tonight. And also, Alex mentioned the, uh, the Awana Grand Prix coming up. If your kids are in grades th third grade through sixth grade, they do a Awana, basically a statewide derby where they design their, their race cars and they go there and they have a good time of fellowship. Um, they'll be getting more information. Jess has the handouts. She'll be sending home with the team kid groups today. So if you say, well, I'm not part of Awana, but you want to be part of the Grand Prix, by all means, jump in for that. You'll get that information uh, today when they, they'll come home with it. Well, the kids will be dismissed on the team kid, kids in discipleship. And we'll be praying for them while they're getting their lesson this morning. And we're going to be back in, in Mark chapter 1 today. We've been looking at this text the past couple weeks, and we've been focusing in on John the Baptist. And what we've seen so far is that John the Baptist, we've seen what he was identified by. He was identified by what he did. He was identified by what he proclaimed, and he was identified by God's power on his life. The last time that we were in this text, we saw that he was sent to prepare the way for others to come to Christ. And we saw that we all have a responsibility to do everything we can just to not make sure that we're prepared to meet the Lord, but to make sure that we're doing everything we can to prepare other people to meet him as well. Amen. And we saw that John the Baptist was humble, and that, that perception of himself led to Jesus coming to him to be baptized. And we saw how God accepts and he's attracted to humble people. That's who he chooses to come alongside. That's who he exalts. And then we saw down towards the end of our text, in verses 9 through 11, that when Jesus was baptized, we saw there that God the Father was pleased with him. And so the challenge that we've seen over the past couple of weeks is to live our own lives in ways that make God look at us and that he's pleased with us as well. We're going to look a little bit further down in our text today, and we're going to look at verses 9 through 15. And we're going to look at not only what happened with John, not only what happened with Jesus, but we're going to see what we can learn and apply from this text together today. So once you found Mark chapter 1 in your Bible, so if you're able to, I want you to stand with me out of the honor of the reading of God's word. Or if you want to scan the QR code on the inside of your bulletin, you can follow along in the YouVersion Bible app that way as well. But in ch Mark chapter 1, let's look, look at verses 9 through 15. It says, And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan. And straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opened and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And immediately the spirit driveth him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted of Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered unto him. Verse 14. Now after that, John was put in prison. Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Let's pray together. Lord, we just thank you so much for this beautiful day that you've given us. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come into your house, Father, to make much of you. Father, we come here today to exalt the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we don't come in here today, we're just saying it's not about us, Father, it's all about you. Everything we do today, Father, all the songs we sing, the encouragement we give, the, 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 everything we get from your word, Father, it's not about us, Father. We wanna make everything we do about you. So Father, I pray you'll help us to do that today. I pray you'll be with the children downstairs. Father, we, just, we, we thank you for children. Yeah. Father, I pray that you'll be with the, the parents and grandparents who are tasked with raising them for your glory and your honor. Give them wisdom. And Father, I pray that while the kids are downstairs and while we as adults are up, upstairs today hearing from your word, I pray that you'll speak to us right where we are. Give us exactly what we need today. Father, as always, nobody needs to hear from me, but we all need to hear from you. Yeah. So Father, I ask you to speak to me. 
Speak through me today, Father. Help me to always say that which would be your will for me to say. We pray all of these things in the perfect, precious, and powerful name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Thank you for standing. You can take your seats. Now, this is an interesting sequence of events. We, when we read the first part of this chapter, everything is going well. Then we get down to where we just read, down th- through verse 15, and there are more challenges. And what we're going to see today is there are going to be times in our lives where things are going to be going really well. There's going to be times when things aren't going so well. There's going to be seasons of life where sometimes everything seems to be going our way, and there's going to be things when they aren't going our way. And I think all of us that are adults, we we know that intellectually, we've experienced that personally, but we're going to look at this biblically today. There's there's an interesting sequence of events. If you look back at verses 9 through 11, the tone is one of joy and happiness. We see the words Jesus, baptized, heaven, dove, pleased. Now, wouldn't it be nice if all, of our, if all of our days were filled with us making the right choices and doing the right things and God showing us his favor by sending him the Holy Spirit to just come, up, come down as a dove and sit on our shoulder and tell us how pleased he is with us? Yep. If God spoke audibly from heaven to tell us how pleased he is with us, wouldn't that be great? Yeah. And, and listen, God can do that if he wants. But, but I'll just say, you know, if God personally, if God wants to let me know that he's pleased with me, you know, I don't need a dove sent my way. There's another bird he could do something for. The Orioles are playing the Rangers today at three. And if God wants to let me know that he's pleased with me, if the Orioles could just make it through the playoffs, that, that'd be, that's all I need. But, but, but seriously, look back at verses nine through 11. Wouldn't it be great if after you got saved and after you got baptized, wouldn't it be great if your life was just one series of one joy after the next? With, with visions of doves in heaven and God patting you on the back and letting you know how great of a job you're doing, wouldn't that be great? That's not how the Christian life works, is it? No, compare the words we see in verses 9 through 11, where we see heaven, dove, pleased, with the words we see following it in verses 12 through 14. Wilderness, temptation, prison. Those verses aren't as fun, are they? What what we're going to see is that there are seasons of life that aren't as fun as the others. We're going to see that no matter what situation or season we're in, we're going to find something else to be true, that God is still in control. And he still has a plan for every season that we find ourselves in. We're going to look at this text today, and we're going to look at this through the lens as it relates to one word. We're going to look at that word, wilderness. If I was going to give today's message, the title would be, What Happens in the Wilderness? Because sometimes we forget about what happens in the wilderness. So let's start by looking at verse 12. When we look at verse 12, oftentimes the word that we focus on is wilderness, where it says that Jesus was driven into the wilderness. But the word that often gets overlooked is the word spirit. And our first point today is very simply, sometimes we need to remember, sometimes the spirit leads us to the wilderness. Notice what the Bible says. It says that as soon as Jesus had been baptized and God the Father had told him that he was pleased with him, it says that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, drove him into the wilderness. And the word drive that we see referenced here comes from the Greek word ekbali, which means strongly compelled and moved. If you keep your spot here in Mark chapter 1, turn over to Matthew chapter 4 real quick, and let's look at Matthew's account of this. Keep your spot here. We'll come back to Mark chapter 1, but let's look at Matthew chapter 4 real quick. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 1, it says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. So we see here the Bible says the Holy Spirit led Jesus to the wilderness. Now, now why is this so important? Why are we looking at this? Because we need to remember, God doesn't always lead us to the happy places. God doesn't always lead us to the easy places. God doesn't always lead us to the safe places. God doesn't always lead us to the fun places and the enjoyable places. Sometimes we see here, sometimes he leads us to the wilderness. And if you've been saved for any length of time, you're going to spend some time in the wilderness. If you are saved for any length of time, you're going to spend some time in the wilderness. Being a Christian does not mean that life is going to be easy. 
It's not always going to be a life of fun and laughter. There will be times when things will be difficult. Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse 33, in this world, ye shall have tribulation. We've seen even from Jesus' own followers, the days aren't always going to be ones of picking up 12 baskets of abundance of food. There will be some times where you're going to go 40 days and 40 days, 40 days and 40 nights without food. But turn over back to Mark chapter 1 or, or just stay there in Matthew chapter 4 if you want. And look at the very next verse. And ask yourself, was Jesus in God's will when he was in the wilderness? Yes, of course he was. So what we have to remember is that you can be completely within God's will for your life and still be going through difficult times. Just because you're going through a difficult time in your life right now, whether it be with your physical health or in your relationships or with your finances, that doesn't necessarily mean that God is putting you through the ringer just to get your attention. Now, sometimes God does allow situations to come into our lives to get our attention, but just because you might find yourself in the wilderness today doesn't necessarily mean that you did something wrong. If you're in the wilderness right now, let me just tell you, you're in good company. Now, if you're in the wilderness because you messed up and, and did something wrong and you fell into sin, that's one thing. But if you're in the wilderness because God led you there, then you're in good company. Yeah. You know who else spent some time in the wilderness? Moses. Do you know Moses spent 40 years in the wilderness by himself before God called him to lead the nation of Israel through the wilderness for another 40 years? 80 years in the wilderness. Now, let me ask you, did God do something with Moses' life? You know, you know who else spent some time in the wilderness? How about Elijah? Did God have a plan for Elijah's time in the wilderness? I think he did. How about the person we look at these past few weeks in John the Baptist? Did he spend some time in the wilderness? He sure did. Did God have a purpose for it? Absolutely. And look what we read about today. Jesus. We see here that he was led to the wilderness. And did God have a reason for that? Yes, he did. We're going to touch on what that reason is in just a little bit. So I wanted to start here today and say two things. And one is this, if you find yourself in the wilderness right now, and it's not because you've been disobedient, it's not because you've been rebellious against God. If you're knowing, if you're doing what you know to do, and yet you find yourself in the wilderness, don't beat yourself up and think that God must be mad at you and he's just trying to get even with you for something. Stop that. Second Corinthians chapter two, verse 11 tells us that we need to be aware of Satan's tricks. We need to be aware of his schemes. And one of the biggest devices that he uses is the lie that if I'm going through something difficult, then God must be mad at me. If there's some problem in my life, God must be trying to wake me up and shake me up and get my attention. Listen, the Bible says the sun shines and the rain falls on the just and the unjust. Ecclesiastes 9.11 says that time and chance happen to all. So stop thinking and assuming that if things are difficult in your life right now, that God is mad at you. He's not. But there's another reason I wanted to start here too. And it's this. If you see other people who seem to be in the wilderness, whose lives just seem to be falling apart, whose lives just seem to be unraveling, their lives just seem difficult right now. Their relationships are struggling. They're having financial difficulties. They're having health problems. Listen to me. Don't assume that God has them in the wilderness because he's punishing them either. You have no idea why God has somebody else in the wilderness. And some of you here today, man, you can attest to this because you've been there. I'll confess I've been there. But some of the darkest times in my life where emotionally, mentally, spiritually, physically, financially, some of the most difficult times in my life were times when I was quote unquote close to the Lord. I was studying my Bible, I was praying, I was going to church, I was serving. I, I hadn't fallen into any overt or terrible sins. But, but I found myself in the wilderness and, and listen to me, I couldn't get out. I, I remember there's times I would cry to God at night, confessing sins and repenting of sins, just saying, well, I must have done something wrong or I wouldn't be in this place. 
And, and for me, just, just to be totally transparent, for me, in my situation, it was right after I submitted to preach. As soon as I made it known that God had called me to preach and I, and I intended to follow that will for my life, I spent time in the wilderness that I had never known before. Physically, mentally, emotionally, I dealt with things during that time that I'd never faced up to that point and I haven't faced since. But look back at our text here in, in Mark chapter one. And notice, that's not unique. That's how it was with Jesus too. As soon as he was baptized, as soon as God voiced his pleasure with Jesus, Satan put a big target on his back and he became the subject of Satan's wrath and temptation. The verse there says it happened immediately. So let me encourage you today. If you're walking through the wilderness, let me tell you this. You might not be in the wilderness today because you did something wrong. You might be in the wilderness because you're doing something right. And if you're in the wilderness right now and you're struggling, listen, I know it's human nature to try to get out of the wilderness as soon as we can and try to find our own way out and to crash and squall and try to do everything we can to get out of the wilderness. But Matthew chapter four says that the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness and we need to trust the Holy Spirit to lead us out of the wilderness. If he led us there, we need to trust him that he's got a purpose for it and he's gonna lead us back out. So the first thing we need to remember about the wilderness is that sometimes the Holy Spirit leads us there. Next thing we need to remember about the wilderness is sometimes that's where God ministers to us. God ministers to us in the wilderness. Look at verse 13 and notice what it says and what we tend to focus on right away. If you're like me, it's really easy to pay really quick attention to being in the wilderness for 40 days with nobody around but Satan and the wild beasts that verse 13 mentions. And let's be honest, that's pretty dark. That's pretty discouraging. That's pretty depressing. And we can be tempted to read that and think that being in the wilderness for 40 days with no other company than Satan tempting us or wildly surrounding us, we can logically arrive at the conclusion that the wilderness has, the wilderness has no place to be. And we should avoid the wilderness at, at all costs. But there's only one problem. It's not what the Bible says. Look back at the text. Jesus was never alone in the wilderness. The Spirit led him there. And let's just think about this for a minute. Do you really think the Holy Spirit led Jesus to the wilderness to leave him there to fend for himself? Do you think the Holy Spirit led Jesus there to abandon him? And before you answer that, let's just acknowledge, isn't that how we often treat this passage? With poor Jesus left alone and defenseless in the wilderness with Satan and the wild beasts. And why do we read it that way? It's because sometimes we interpret this, th that passage that way because that's how we feel when we're in the wilderness. When we're going through hard times, it's our human nature to feel alone. It's our human nature to, to feel abandoned. It's our human tendency to feel forgotten about. But we need to remember that the Spirit never left Jesus when he was in the wilderness, and we need to remember he'll never leave us in the wilderness either. Look a little bit further. And you'll notice, Jesus had more company in the wilderness than just the Holy Spirit. The end of verse says that angels ministered to him. So, so let's do the math. I, I'm not great at math, and I didn't bring a calculator. I probably should have. But I think I can get through this, okay? There's one Jesus, right? One Holy Spirit and one Satan. So Satan's already outnumbered. And then angels, plural, now, we don't know how many angels there were with Jesus there in the wilderness, but there are at least two because it uses the plural term angels. So Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and at least two angels against Satan. Satan's already outnumbered at least four to one. And we don't know. There could have been thousands and thousands, millions of angels. So let me ask you this. If you're in the wilderness and you start feeling scared and overwhelmed, or helpless and defenseless and anxious, would it help you feel a little bit more hopeful and a little bit more confident if you knew it wasn't just you against Satan? Would you feel a little bit better if you had an unbelievable, numerical, powerful advantage over him? Well, guess what? You do. 
The Holy Spirit will never leave you nor forsake you. And listen, I know it's easy for us to think I can't win this. But the reality is you can't lose. Keep your spot here. Turn over to 1 John chapter 4. I'm going to give a few other references to write down. Because these are verses that will help us to remember we don't go to the wilderness to lose. We go to the wilderness to win. 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. Notice the words and the tenses used here. Ye are of God, little children. No matter where you are or what you're facing right now, remember, you are God's child. You are a son or a daughter of God Almighty, the God who took a world of nothing and literally spoke everything into existence. That's your father. You are of God, little children. And look what it says next. And have overcome them. It's already settled. It doesn't say you will overcome. It says you already have overcome. Why? Not because you're anything, because your father is everything. And in case we need to be reminded, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Listen, God is greater than Satan. God is stronger than temptation. God is bigger and mightier and more powerful than anything you will ever face in the wilderness. And we need to remember this. Because sometimes we're in the wilderness, we tend to forget who our God is. We forget who our Father is. And here's a few other verses to write down and make note of. Romans chapter 8, verse 31. If God be for us, who can be against us? 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And guess what? If God says we're going to overcome the world, we're definitely going to overcome the wilderness we're in right now. This might seem like a really big deal. It's never going to end, but God is going to lead us through this. In, in, in Romans chapter 8, verse 37, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Listen, can I just remind you today? God's not just a little bit more powerful than the devil. He's not just a little bit stronger than our temptations. He's not just a little bit more powerful than the wilderness that we find ourselves in right now. And here's the thing. We're not just a little bit capable of surviving in the wilderness. We don't have to just escape the wilderness by the skin of our teeth. No, we're not just conquerors. We're more than conquerors through him that loved us. And in his love for us, God doesn't lead us to the wilderness to succumb to temptation. He doesn't lead us there to lay down and die. He doesn't lead us there to become victims. He leads us there to lead us back out victorious. So when we're in the wilderness, we need to stop seeing ourselves as less than, less than equipped, less than prepared, less than capable. We need to stop seeing ourselves as less than and start seeing ourselves as more than. Second Chronicles chapter 25, verse 9 says, the Lord is able to give thee much more than this. We just saw Romans chapter 8, verse 37, we are more than conquerors. I made my fear there, 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 16. He answered, fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with him. See, we, we can learn something from Jesus here. We can remember the wilderness doesn't have to scare us. Satan doesn't have to defeat us. And listen, I know he's Jesus and we're not. He's capable of things that, we, that we're not capable of. But I think the key is still the same to overcoming the wilderness. It's something that we can apply to. We see the reason why Jesus was able to get victory over Satan's temptations and come through the wilderness unscathed was because he knew that when he was in the wilderness, he knew he wasn't alone. But sometimes when we're in the wilderness, we look around, we don't see the Holy Spirit. We don't see that white dove. We don't see the angels. And we think, man, I'm, I'm outnumbered here. And we forget that God will never leave us nor forsake us. We forget that greater is he that, than us than he that's in the world. And if we can just remember that we are not just conquerors, we are more than conquerors. 
If we can remember what Hebrews chapter 13, verse two says, where it mentions angels unawares. How God often places angels in our lives at the, the exact time when we need them to help us without us ever recognizing it. We have to remember, we're never alone in the wilderness. Look back at the end of, of verse 13 in Mark chapter one. And think about this question, because how we answer this question will largely shape our feelings about the trials that we face. How we answer this question will shape our feelings about those times in the wilderness. Think about this for a minute. Did God lead Jesus to the wilderness to be tempted? Or did he lead Jesus to the wilderness to be ministered to? Literally, what this comes down to is how do you view God? Do you feel God? Do you view God as just this cold, distant being who's just going to try to put you through the ringer, just to try to make things difficult, just for the sake of it? Or do you view God as a loving God who has a purpose and plan for your life, even though we don't understand it? And in His love for us. Sometimes he calls us out of those safe spaces yeah. and leads us into the wilderness. Yeah. Why? Not because it's easy. Not because it's comfortable. But sometimes it's when we're in our darkest moments, when we're in our most difficult times, where the Lord comes and ministers to us in ways that we've never experienced before. Right. Yeah. Amen. All of us are adults here today. And there, there are people today, I, 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 haven't, I haven't asked for the permission to share this story, so I'm not going to, but I'll just speak in generalities. There, 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 have been, there are people here this morning that have gone through wilderness of emotional turmoil, mental turmoil that God led them back out of. And they are closer to God right now today than they were before they ever went into that wilderness. Amen. There, there are relationships right here that have been restored that went through a wilderness period where there was trials, there were challenges, and God brought them back together, brought them through that wilderness, and they're closer to God right now than they were before they ever went into the wilderness. There are people right here right now who've gone through physical trials. They've gone through wilderness where everything seemed dark, everything seemed bleak, feeling like there was no answer. And they were probably asking, why am I here? And then they found out, oh, God's going to minister to me here. And they felt his presence. They felt his power. And they're living, in, they felt that in such a way they're closer to God right now than they ever would have been if they had avoided the wilderness. How do we view God? Does he have a purpose and plan for our time in the wilderness? I think he does. Amen. We need to remember that God doesn't just lead us to the wilderness to be manipulated. He leads us there so he can minister to us. And, and let's be honest, if we could, if we could avoid those wilderness times in our lives, most of us would avoid them. You know, if, if we had like a remote controller in our life and say, well, this, this, this looks like a hard time coming up. I'm going to skip this scene real quick. Let's just get, let's get past this. Most of us, if we could, if we could avoid the difficult times in our lives, if we could avoid the wilderness, we'd have avoid it. If we could avoid the pain and the suffering and the heartache and the difficulties that naturally occur in life, most of us would avoid those times. But I think all of us here today can probably speak from experience about her, how during our times of brokenness and pain and sorrow, those were the times that God showed up in your life, he held you in his arms and he ministered to you in ways that you never experienced before going into the wilderness. So we see here two things that we need to remember about the wilderness. One is that sometimes the Holy Spirit leads us there. We need to remember we're never alone. There's always a purpose for us being in the wilderness. And that God, God shows up in the wilderness and meets us there and ministers to us there. And our final thought for today, let's look back a little bit earlier in our chapter, Mark chapter one. We see something else we need to remember when we're going through difficult times. What we need to remember is that when we're going through difficult times in the wilderness, what we need to remember is a lot of good things happen in the wilderness. Look back at verse four and notice something. There, there are some good testimonies in the wilderness. Look where John was in verse four. It says he was in the wilderness. And look what God allowed him to do while he was there. He got to preach the gospel. He, he got to see people put their faith in Christ. He saw people get saved and, and start their lifelong journey of a follower of Jesus Christ. Where? It's all started right there in that wilderness. And here's the thing. God will sometimes call you to use your gifts, not in the most popular places. 
God will sometimes call you to use your gifts, not in the booming cities or the destinations that everyone oohs and ahs about. Sometimes God will call you to use your gifts in the wilderness. And sometimes I feel like we might think, well, you know, I, I got to get this area of my life taken care of first. I, I've got to get out of this wilderness mentally or spiritually or emotionally or financially or relationally. I got to get out of this wilderness before God can use me. I got to get out of this wilderness myself before I can be used. But that's not what we see here in this text. Notice here, God used a man, a person who was living in the wilderness. He was serving God in a remote, difficult area. He was serving God in a difficult location. Look what God did. God used that person in that difficult area to do some really awesome things. Look at verse five. Now, I love this thought. Oftentimes we do everything we can to get out of the wilderness, but look at verse five. It says, all the people from Judea and Jerusalem. Judea was 45, minute, 45 miles away from the Jordan River. Jerusalem was 21 miles away from the Jordan River. It says all the people left their cities. They left their ease. They left their comfort to go where? To go to the wilderness. Now, why would they do that? Because they heard about somebody else who was in the wilderness that could help them. What it comes down to is this. Sometimes the reason why the Holy Spirit leads us into the wilderness is because we would never choose to go there on our own. Now, if you go online, you go to Expedia and start trying to book a, book a vacation, you're, you're probably not looking for the hotels in the wilderness. Oh, wait, wait, oh I, can get a good, I can get a great deal. Oh, I can stay three nights and get a fourth night thrown in free if I go through some difficulties. Sign me up for that. The reason the Holy Spirit has to lead us into the wilderness is because most of us would never go there willingly. We would never choose it. We would never choose that for ourselves. We don't naturally gravitate towards difficult areas or difficult situations because our, it's our human nature to try to avoid those situations. But the Holy Spirit will lead us there. And here's the thing, not only to minister to us as we just saw, but sometimes he leads us to the wilderness so that we can minister to other people who are going through difficult times. And sometimes we lose this perspective, but maybe God has you going through a difficult time right now, not just to prepare you, but maybe there's somebody else who's going through something similar. And they need to be, be encouraged by someone who's been through it, who can give a firsthand account about how God can lead them through this. Sometimes God leads us through the wilderness, not just for ourselves, but so we can be an encouragement to other people that are going through difficult times. Now, the wilderness, as we've seen, the wilderness can be a scary place, even if we know we have the Holy Spirit with us. Even though we know there might be angels there with us that we can't see, Here's the thing, sometimes it helps us to have somebody there who we can see. And when those people came up from Judea and Jerusalem, they didn't see Jesus. He, he wasn't there yet. He hadn't arrived. They didn't see the angels that are mentioned there in verse 13. But they did see John. And here's the thing. We're not Jesus. We're not angels but we can be somebody's John. We can be in the wilderness to meet people who come to us and point them to Christ. We can be people who've gone through difficult times who are willing to stay there, not because it's comfortable or convenient for us, but because somebody else needs us to be there when they come to the wilderness themselves. There's gotta be some people who, who are willing to be led by the Spirit into the wilderness and say, look, this is hard. This is difficult. This isn't what I would choose, but somebody needs me here right now. And God has me here right now, not just for me, but because God's going to send somebody here who is hurting, who is struggling, and they need somebody that they can see who can point them back to Christ when they're going through difficult times. Some of you, that might, you might be going through some things right now physically. You might think, man, I, I, don't, I don't know why God is doing this. It could be because somebody else that you love is, is going to be struggling sim in a similar way soon, and they're going to be able to look at you and say, hey, she went through this wilderness, and God led her through it. Some of you maybe have gone through some things difficult relationally right now, and, and the, you might think, well, I don't know why this is happening. Why did God allow this to happen? Maybe God allowed that to happen because somebody else you love is going to have some relationship issues and they need to be able to look at you as an example that God can do anything and lead you back through that wilderness. Maybe you're going through some things uh, financially and you're trying to get things taken care of and it looks hopeless and they can look at you and say, man, God did that for them. He can do that for anybody. 
We need to remember the, the wilderness isn't a place to be avoided. Sometimes that's where God leads us. And he leads us there because that's where he ministers to us. Sometimes God leads us to the wilderness, not just to minister to us, but so that we can be somebody else's John. So when other people inevitably are going through difficult times, going into the wilderness, they can see living proof of someone else where they don't see Jesus. They don't see the angels, but they see us. Someone who can give a testimony and testify that God can lead us here and he can lead us back out. If you're here today and you're going through the wilderness, don't do everything you can to get out as quick as possible. God's got a purpose for you while you're there. Let's let God work in our hearts. If we get every head bowed, every eye closed, ask Ms. Chan to come forward as we prepare for a time of invitation. If you're here today and say, you know what? I've heard about Jesus. I've heard about salvation, but I don't have a personal relationship with him, but I want to. The Bible says that God loves you so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die in your place. And no matter what you've ever done, no, no matter, the Bible says that all of us have sinned, we all fall short of God's glory. But that God loved us enough that he sent Jesus to die on the cross in our place. We can be forgiven. Maybe you're here today and say, you know, I, I'm, I'm going through life, I'm carrying this load of guilt and shame and I've got this burden and I just want to give it to God. I, I know I can't earn my own salvation. I know I can't work hard enough to be there, but I believe that he sent Jesus to die in my place. I'd like someone to, to talk with me today to know how I can be saved. If that's you today, if you, I won't call you out or ask you to walk an aisle or embarrass you in any way. If you just look up and make eye contact with me, I'd love to connect you with somebody who can walk you through the Bible, what God's word says about having a relationship with him. If you're here today and say, you know what? I, I'm in a bit of a wilderness right now. And I, I've been kind of maybe looking at it from the angle of maybe I've messed up. Maybe, I, maybe God's trying to get my attention. But God spoke to my heart today and maybe I'm not just here because I messed up. Maybe I'm here because he actually led me here. I want God to open my heart, open my eyes to being sensitive to being okay with being in the wilderness. I'm hurting right now. There's some things going, I'm going through some things right now that are difficult. I wouldn't choose this. But I want God to help me to believe that there's something good he's gonna do out of this. If that's your prayer today. If you'll slip your hand up, we'll pray to you about that. Amen. Yes, we see those hands. Yes, amen. You can take them down if you're raising. Amen. Maybe you say, you know, I'm in the wilderness right now. Going through some difficult times and I know God has a purpose and a plan. I just, help me to recognize it when he wants to minister to me. Help me to know, help me to get what he wants me to out of my time in, in the wilderness. Help me not just to try to press fast forward. Help me to be, if God led me here, I want to get everything he wants me to out from this time while I'm here. Help me to be patient. Help me to have the strength I need to endure while I'm in this wilderness right now. God, spoke your heart on that way. If you'll just slip your hand, I'll pray to you about that. Amen. Yes, we seal those hands. Amen. You can take them now. Maybe say, you know, I've gone through some difficult times in my life financially, physically, relationally. And I just want to ask God to use my wilderness experience to bless somebody else. I don't want that to be in vain. I want to ask God just to send someone into my life that my experience can be a blessing to. Let God use my story. Let him use my path. Let him use my history to strengthen people who might be going through something similar. If that's your prayer today, you'll slip your hand up and pray to you about that. Amen. Yes, we see those hands. Amen. While the music plays, if the Holy Spirit spoke to your heart today, let's respond to him. If you need to be saved, please come forward and talk to the Lord about that. Let somebody know. The Lord spoke to your heart through the message, or if there's anything else on your heart you do business with the Lord about, let's take some time now and respond to the Holy Spirit how he would have us to.
Our Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for your word. Father, we, we thank you for your son, Jesus. Yes. Father, you tell us in your word that, that he suffered in all ways that yes. we were tempted so that we could be an encouragement, so that he could be an encouragement to us. And Father, we see today he went to the wilderness. Father, we can learn from his example. Father, I pray that you'll help us as best we can. Father, no one likes problems. No one likes pain. But Father, when you have a purpose for our life and you lead us anywhere, even if you lead us through the wilderness, Father, help us not go kicking and screaming. Help us to let you lead us wherever it is you want us to go. Help us to trust that you have a purpose for all of our pain. Help us to, to, to trust that there's a plan for, for the, the difficult times that we go through. And Father, I pray for those today who, who've asked for prayer about that, Father, about being willing to be led through this time in the wilderness. Father, I just pray that Father, there's a lot of people that on our prayer list, there's people that we know, people in our workplaces, people in our families, people in our communities who, who are going through unbelievably difficult times right now. And Father, we lift them up in prayer to you and ask you to, during this, these difficult times, Father, I pray that they will sense your presence ministering to them. I pray that you will comfort them in, in, in ways that only you can do, that you will be the God of all comfort. You'll get, provide them with a peace that passes all understanding. Father, I thank you for the many people here today who can testify that when we were going through our most difficult times, that's when you met us. That's when you ministered to us. Father, I thank you don't forget us about you don't I thank you that you don't forget about us. You don't leave us to fend for ourselves. And Father, I pray that you'll help us today to remember that as we go forward. Father, I pray for those, Father, who've asked for prayer. To that you will use their life, use their example, use their story, use their testimony to be a blessing to somebody else. Father, there might be some people right now going through some difficult things that, Father, I pray that you'll use it for your glory, you'll use it for your honor. Father, you tell us that all things work together for good. I pray that you'll use the pain that we're going through individually and collectively as a church. Use us, Father. Use it as an opportunity to be a blessing to other people who are going to go through similar things down the road. Father, help us be willing to, to meet them in the wilderness, to be willing to uh, emotionally and sometimes physically go back to the places that might be difficult for us to go to if it means helping other people. Father, we just thank you so much for your word. We thank you for your love for us. Help us go forward, Father, as we, as we go through difficult times to find your path to walk with you and to sense your presence in all that we do. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you very much for your for your time and attention. If you, uh, the prayer lists are on the uh, welcome table in the lobby. Please make sure you stop and get a prayer list on your way out. If there's anything I can do for you, anything I can pray for you about, please find me before you, before you leave today. And also if you're planning on going up to the revival service at Village Baptist Church, we'll plan to meet here.